Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to 2024. Oh, wait, we're already in 2024. Welcome to MGM, Monday General Mentorship. First session of the year is happening tonight. Hope you all had a great holiday and your new year wasn't too hungover, LOL. This mentoring session is brought to you by NotaryStars.com, and thank you so much for spending time with us tonight and allowing us to be a voice along your path. This public training session is held every Monday except for holidays at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard, 8 p.m. Eastern, and it's all about you, the notary and signing agent community. Today is Monday, January 8th. I had to look at my calendar here. My name is Beth Hatfield. I'm the lead instructor for Notary Stars, and I have with me tonight one of my two co-hosts, Mr. Ronnie Mickle, the founder and co-owner of Notary Stars, Unlimited Inc. Notary, and Online Notaries Public, and Mr. William Bumphrey, aka Mr. Bill, isn't here tonight, but he's our expert remote online notary instructor here at Notary Stars and the online notarypublic.com listing site. Our session tonight is all about taxes, and I am so excited to welcome back Sue Hope, the owner and co-founder of Notaries of Software. That's an on a accounting, bookkeeping, and all around notary business management tool designed for the notary pro professional. Sue is a commissioned notary and loan signing agent in California and has been since 1999. She's almost the OG, right? Her company, Lava Turtle Software Inc., opened in 2007. Um, Sue introduced Notary Assist to the notary community at the NNA conference of that same year. Sue is also a regular speaker and presenter at NNA conferences. This evening, Sue has partnered with Miss Glenn Hill, also welcoming her back to the tribe tonight. Um, she's an amazing, fun, and knowledgeable tax professional with 20 plus years experience in the world of taxes. It just so happens that Glenn is also a commissioned notary in California. So I'm guessing they both know our pain points as notaries, right? Glenn is here to help break down some of the important business do's and don'ts, and she can also outline for you what you need to be tracking. Together, Sue and Glenn hope to take away some of the fear and stress out of taxes and give you the knowledge to slay your taxes this season. Couple of quick mentions, guys. If you would, please consider following us on social media. Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook. We'll post all of those links in the chat for you here in just a little bit. Um, but I don't want to delay too much in getting our session started. So, Ronnie, do you want to kick off this meeting? Yes, I actually just want to welcome, welcome you both back, Sue and Glenn. Uh, you've been a part of the Notary Star journey for uh, quite a while now. Um, I actually started my notary business uh, with uh, like really getting it off the ground with notary assist. I still pay my notary assist account uh, to this day. We've moved on to QuickBooks as a signing service. One of the things that I want to say, and and you know, I'll get to good things about Miss Glenn as well. But one of the good things that I want to say about notary assist is I love the person, uh, the personability behind a software. At Notary Stars, you guys know if you write or call or email, I'm on the phone with you. I got that same level of support from Notary Assist. And, you know, what they say is birds of a feather flock together um, by by uh, tooling around with Miss Sue over the, the years. By the way, who both of these ladies uh, write wonderful blog articles once a month on tax tips for you throughout the year where you might be in your business. They're all at the Notary Stars blogs. But I also want to say, you know, by tooling around with Miss Sue and learning all the things that I've learned from her over the years and using her software and watching it grow, I got to meet Miss Glenn. And I have to tell you, last year's presentation was just amazing. I can't wait for tonight. Um, and I just want everybody to know that uh, Glenn Hill, the tax lady, uh, deemed herself the tax lady. It's not a nickname we gave to her. It is something that she, she calls herself. And I actually asked her last year, are, is it okay to say that? 
So I'm not just calling her lady for the sake of, you know, the sake of calling her lady. Well, with just saying that, I just want to say thank you both for being here. And Travis, my business partner at Unlimited Inc. and at Notary Stars is also here tonight as a co-host. Um, he, uh, you know, he's always on the phones at night while I'm able to do this. And he said, this is one session I really want to be here for because he, he too and I too can learn things. And every year taxes change a little bit, right? So it's it's best to have sessions like this where we can actually come together and find out what's changed. So I'm going to shut up now and I'm going to turn it over to you ladies and let you uh, start your your presentation for tonight. Woo -woo. Ronnie, thank you so much, Beth. Oh my gosh, Travis, thank you all at Notary Stars for having us again. It's one of my favorite places to pop in and chat is Notary Stars. And I'm hoping to be in the Arizona area in March. So uh, hopefully I get to have uh, some in-person time as well. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and Glenn, I'm so excited you are here with us again. And Happy New Year, everybody. I know this is our first chance getting to wish you all a Happy New Year. So thanks for joining us this evening. And I know taxes are not usually the funnest conversation, but we're going to have fun because taxes are necessary, but we're going to take the fear out of it because we're going to slay tax season because we're getting started early. We're getting um, the wonderful information from Miss Glenn, and we are going to be able to just crush tax season. So I want to say thank you to Miss Glenn. She's been an amazing colleague, partner, friend over the last year and a half, and she's been teaching me so much. And I'm so grateful that she's taking time out to be with us tonight because I can help you record everything, but Glenn's going to tell you what you can record. <laughs> So she's the expert. I'm going to turn it over to her. I'm so excited for the presentation she has for you tonight. And I'm here to be her biggest cheerleader and also to answer questions on how um, we can help you organize your information so that it's much easier to slay your taxes. Glenn, go for it, girlfriend. Thank you. And thank you for that introduction. So good to see you, uh, Ronnie, Beth, and, and the uh, entire a uh, group of folks that have joined tonight. So thank you for uh, joining us this evening. Um, as part of the introduction, I do want to uh, kind of piggyback off of what Ronnie said. I do have uh, now 22 years of experience um, preparing tax returns, individual and small business tax returns. Um, and I'm in uh, the works of getting my EA, which is an enrolled agent with the IRS. For those that are unfamiliar, um, that's uh, a different level of certification and a different level of screening as well as uh, the um, testing that's involved in that to be able to become an enrolled agent with the IRS. Um, so it's just another level and another tier that I'll have under my belt here, hopefully by the end of year. Um, so looking forward to that. Now, let's see. Let's see if I remember how to do this, Ronnie, since last year. I'm sharing my screen to get to my PowerPoint. Um, let me we are here for you. Awesome. Let's see. I'm sharing uh, this screen, actually. And let's share that. Um, so uh, once again, Happy New Year. Uh, happy 2024 to all of you. Um, I will share my contact information. Um, I'll share the, our agenda. And then I'll also um, reserve a little time for or for any questions anyone might have. I'm not sure, Beth, if if we're doing as we did last year, where the questions can be added into the into the chat there. And then we'll kind of, um, OK, perfect. And then yeah, we'll, anytime we'll anybody that, right? has any questions, they can throw them in the chat. Or guys, just get ready to raise your hands as we yeah. get toward the end of that presentation. And we can take live questions, too, if okay. you don't mind, Glenn. Is that yeah. OK? Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great go. idea. Let's do it that way. Okay. So, um, so today's ag agenda, I've kind of already told you a little bit about me. Uh, my contact information will be on this next slide. Um, we'll talk about getting ready, right? So we're in the, we're in January. So quite honestly, um, to Sue's point, we're getting ahead of, you know, getting our taxes filed and going to your, either your CPA or tax professional, um, or even possibly even doing them yourself. Um, but up until now, you should have been tracking those expenses and that income, right? Yeah, hard <laughs> if you've been doing that. And, um, you know, so some of those last minute uh, entries, totally fine. But you're going to find that um, the better organized you are throughout the year, even if you're doing your entries 
you know, once a month, right? Or if um, you're you're that busy, um, and I know that the industry slowed down a little bit, but if you're still that busy, you know, quarterly even in, entering that information in versus waiting till the end of the year, right? And then being under that um, that pressure and that anxiety and, you know, that angst that you just really don't need, you know, to add to your already busy lives. We'll talk about obviously taxes and more specifically self-employment taxes and how that uh, applies to you as notaries, to us as notaries. Um, Common deductions. Uh, we'll touch a little bit on the Corporate Transparency Act, which I'm sure everyone has heard of by now. Um, for those of us that are required to uh, submit the beneficial um, owner uh, information, ownership information, uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, and how to find a tax professional for those of you that don't have one or maybe feel like you may need to go to someone new this year because maybe it's your first year in business um, or being self-employed that type of thing. So we'll talk about that and then we'll cover questions. Um, so I'll pull this up for just a second here. Um, can you guys see that by the way, or can you see this as well? We can see the beginning of the PowerPoint presentation. We're on the uh, calculator screen right now that says tax help, which I think is so cool. Perfect. Okay. So um, it should, what you should see is that it um, again says that I've been a tax professional since 2001. I actually worked for uh, a very large um, tax preparation um, company that uh, most people are familiar with, H&R Block, and um, worked with them for uh, for right about 10 years and then went and um, started doing my own thing and said, you know, I've been doing this for a little bit. I think I've got enough experience and let me scale my business, right? So that's what I did. Uh, again, uh, and now five years as an LSA, so loan signing agent for five years. Um, just renewed my notary, I think, a few months ago, actually. So Yay. So that's my information there. I am based out of the Riverside County, uh, California area, but I um, have customers in all of the counties in California and probably about 22 or 23 different states that I have customer uh, clients in. Uh, my military clients as well, if they're deployed. So I, I guess you can say I have international clients as well. <laughs> um, so I have that. And then again, here's my contact information. Um, I'll send this PowerPoint over to Ronnie in case anybody needs that information uh, and can't jot this down. Feel free uh, to jot that down if you'd like to, and I can enlarge that if we need to. Just to, don't want to take up too much of uh, Sue's time as well for her presentation. So and Ms. Glenn, we did have a request since you mentioned that. We did have a request if you could enlarge this, the screens because we're seeing the uh, the slides, can you go into presenter mode uh, to get it a little bit larger for the people viewing? Yeah, so presenter mode. Refresh my memory, Ronnie. Miss Beth, see. that is your, so your department. Because <laughs> I use uh, Canva now. I, I haven't um, used it. I think Let's it's see. in view. Slideshow, it's almost, it's on I your... I was going to say uh, slideshow, yeah. Yeah, slideshow on your... Um, Right above your bar there, you see where okay. it says file home insert, go almost all the way to the middle, it says sh slideshow. Oh, right here. Yeah. Okay. Is that better? I think it's going to have a little bit of a lag. I don't see the change yet. It didn't say, it didn't show anything. Um, come back over to the bar on the left. Um, wait. Your I'm slideshow sorry, should give you an option to start the slideshow. Oh, um, let's Click see. Click on it again. Let's see. Nope, not there. So if you follow sorry, that, guys. if you follow that all along to the middle, where it says slideshow, click on yeah, that. Yeah, that's what I I thought I did. There you, go. there you go. From the beginning, and you then you can it. advance it by click. Ta da! Okay, and there, there we go. All of this. Much bigger. This Thank is you. Cool. Sorry, guys. Work in real time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that technical support. I appreciate it. Sorry about it that, guys. It takes a village. It's all good. That's all good. <laughs> okay. And so there's my contact information. I'll give it. I'll give it a minute here because we, with the technical difficulties there, while you're jotting all that down. And just so you know. Nobody's going to know there were technical difficulties because we're going to just cut this out so that nobody knows that we didn't just do this. I love it. Even only, better. <laughs> only the people here and it's all our secret. Okay, perfect. Even better. All right. 
you'll see that this is why I created another email. Um, to, to Ronnie's point, I've been Tax Lady Glenn for, gosh, 15 years now. Um, and this was my very long uh, website name too. Taxes done by Glenn Hill even. I only dropped off the hill this last year. Um, but you can see that's, you know, that's the longest email ever. So I was like, you know what, let's, let's make that a little bit nicer for everyone. Okay. So on to the next. So at this we, point, we like simple Glenn for sure. I know, I know. <laughs> same here, same here. Okay, so uh, reconcile and review, right? So um, you're going to want to not notify all of the uh, companies or individuals that you've worked for that could possibly need to uh, send you a 1099 form. So um, anything over six hundred dollars in income, they're required to send you a 1099. And specifically that form is a 1099 NEC. NEC stands for non-employee compensation, okay? Um, you'll wanna notify them now if your address has changed, right? So since you started working with them and you sent, sent them your W-9 information or your contact information, you told them where to mail it, or they pulled your information from some of the platforms that you know you, know, you get your alerts from um, of any uh, you know notaries that, that are available in your area, um, you'll want to have up updated your address and contact information there because that delay could cause your taxes to be incorrect, right? Because you're thinking, especially if you've not been as organized as you could be, um, and believe me, we've all been there, you know, no, no, um, no pointing anyone out, if you will, and those, those habits will get better over time. Um, but the better you can uh, have record of who you owe that information to, the better off you're going to be and to get that in, in a timely manner, okay? Um, I say timely manner because uh, I think most people know and understand that January 31st, typically you have all of your, you know, your documents in the mail, whether it's from your, you know, mortgage and your lenders and, you know, maybe school loan document or, you know, school interest that you paid. In the world of 1099s NEC, although that that is a cutoff time frame for um, everyone else. I can tell you that many times in our business, in our industry, that there's a delay. Sometimes you're getting that in the first week of February, the second week, and in some cases, even the end, right? So that's why it's so important to make sure you've been tracking what your income is, okay? And what you, who you should be receiving 1099 forms from. Um, so if you're using a, a notary assist software, the good thing with that is you can very quickly pull up a report and see, you know, which client paid me over $600 that I know is going to send me a, a 1099 form, right? Um, so there's that. So you'll want to query those reports, pull such um, reports as your profit and loss statements, your mileage, and your expense reports. Those are the kind of the key ones um, that your tax professional is going to want to see, right? Um, and to be able to also... Um, ensure that all of those numbers are in the right places on your tax return. There might be some questions if, um, and you, and it's okay if you get questions from your tax professional that says, you know, I'm not quite sure what this is. You labeled it this this way, maybe in notary assist, right? Um, but what does that mean? And, and um, hopefully you have an idea of why did I put it in that bucket or that category? Or, um, you know, be able to explain it to your tax professional what that is. Um, and have a relationship with your tax professional. If you don't have someone you have regularly, but you want to find someone that, you know, um, that understands the business and that you can have regularly, that is accessible, know that I am all those things, right? And again, I have clients all over the um, the nation. Well, 22 states now. Um, that if you want someone like that, that you want to continuously be able to say, okay, you know, this is what this is what this is, information is. Should I code that differently? Should that be a different category so it makes sense next year when I, you know, pull reports or what have you? Um, you know, be able to talk that through, and they'll be able to tell you, yeah, you might want to relabel it this for um, for simplicity's sake. Um, so ordinary and customary expenses. Um, so just as it sounds, ordinary and customary expenses. You cannot you do not want to create um, or rename it things that um, are not expenses that you typically write off as a notary. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, so if someone says that they purchased eight laptops, right? Um, and they have no employees, right? And they don't um, make maybe a whole lot of money to even offset those expenses. You, let's say you paid eight, paid for eight, eight laptops, eight laptops, but you put that you, that was like $8,000, 
that those laptops were. They were a thousand each, which that's what they're running these days, right? But you don't have anything to really kind of offset that to say that there was a need to have eight laptops that year for that year of business. Those are red flags, right? Because the IRS is saying, well, why is there a need to have eight laptops written off when there's only really one of you and no employees? And you don't really have anything to substantiate that. I'm just giving you that as an example. Um, and then the customary, um, or sorry, ordinary, are th and we'll talk about that in a minute, what some of those expenses are and what things you want to make sure you account for. Um, I can tell you that there are some that are missed. And uh, having someone that knows the notary world and notary industry, um, I bring that to many of my clients' attention. The most common one that comes to mind is the subscriptions we pay for right? Yeah, <laughs> the subscriptions that we pay for and, um, you know, the platforms that we pay for and things like that. Um, renewing our notary, right, commission, those things are, are sometimes missed. So I bring it to um, some of my clients' attention. So you'll want to review all of your 1099 forms that you do receive, okay? You may receive duplicates or those amounts are different than what you thought they should be, I'll give you an example. If you worked for a signing service and you're expecting a $750 1099 C form from them, any C form from them, and you get one for $900 and you go, wait, where's that other $150? I, I, I didn't work that for, with them. You, It's okay to contact them and say, you know, I don't show that I earn $900 with you. But can we kind of go over that? And maybe I missed one of my signings that year that, you know, and they have record of that as well. Um, or they'll tell you to go to the platform that they assigned you those um, signings in and you should be able to also, you know, kind of reconcile it that way. Or the other scenario is it was in December, right? And you got paid um, the $900, but you did not get that check until January. And in your brain, I entered that in my January right? Um, the reconciliation in, in my software, my bookkeeping software, whatever that is that you've uh, decided to use. Um, but the seven hundred, the $150, the signing service accounted for that in 2023. They, they show in their records, they paid that to you. They may, may have sat on it for a week or so, right? Um, but it's, it's accounted for and, and paid out to you in, 20, in tax year 2023. And if your signing was in 2023, it makes sense, right? Now, if your signing was in January, they can't say that. Okay. I love that you just answered that question. I get that <laughs> call all the time. So yeah. it, it it definitely helps that you keep track of these appointments. And the ones that are really hard are the ones on like December 28th, 29th, mm -hmm. 30th, 31st, because you might not receive a check until the beginning of the year. But mm -hmm. look at the check's date. If they yeah. dated it by the 31st, a lot of times they want to write that off in the year mm -hmm that you did it so that they can get that off their books. Sorry, right. I just jumped in, but no. I love that you answered that question. <laughs> no, no problem. Yeah, I think that's on one of my other slides as an example, because I get that too. They say, well, but I didn't get it until, you know, January or depending on their payment terms, February, right? And I go, well, but, but you provided the service in December. That's when you should have been paid. It took them a while to pay you, yes, but that's when you should account for that income when it was earned. Okay, uh, include all income received, even if not reported on a 1099, okay? Uh, this is another tough one if you're not keeping good records of what your income is, right? Um, so if you have multiple signing services or you have multiple um, escrow offices that you work with and the, you, know, you get this business from, or um, really wherever you get the business from, general notary work, right? Um, if you're not accounting or including that and in accounting for that, then one, you're shorting your income reported to the IRS, right? Um, and then two, um, depending on your overall income, it could make changes in the way of certain credits that could apply to your tax return, certain tax credits, okay? Um, so it's important to report that. And I can tell you that I've seen it more times than not where people, some clients think that, well, I won't report it because I didn't get a 1099 form, right? So that's less income I'm, I'm going to report and that's less taxes I'm going to have to pay. And lo and behold, a year or two later, or even three, that entity, that, in, that company has sent that form to the IRS, right? Or... Um, what sometimes happens is people say, well, because it was under $600, I was under the impression I don't have to report it. That's not true. 
you still want to have count, accounted for all of your income. Not to all, not to also um, get too off topic. Actually, it might be the next slide, but um, that's how much you're paying in Social Security, right? And Social Security taxes for your income that you've earned. Yeah, so you don't want to short yourself that when that's uh, towards your retirement, right? And towards your Social Security and what's required for you to pay in taxes. So I'm going to stop here for just a second, just to see were there any questions in the chat or any hands that I that I may have missed. The one question you've already answered, Glenn, was from someone saying, hey, if I didn't earn more than $600 from that company, I don't have to report it. Yeah, you do. You have to you report do. all earned income. It's yeah. just that you're looking for that 1099 um, for income over $600 from that company. That yeah. doesn't mean that if you only made 300 from that company, they're not still going to send you a 1099. All it right. means is that they're not required to send you a 1099 for anything under $600. You've got it. Absolutely. I love that you touched on that. That is so huge. And I wanted to parlay into one extra little thing of the 1099s, Glenn, before you go on. And maybe this is on the next slide. So I apologize if I'm jumping the gun. But for those notaries that network or collaborate with other notaries, they have to reconcile so that they can submit a 1099 to them as well, correct? That is correct. That is correct. Yes, and that is on the on the next slide. I think. Okay, sorry. No, no, you're fine. <laughs> totally fine. I'm glad you said that. Um, so just to close out this slide, so you'll want to compile again all income expenses per um income source. So I say this because I also see this a lot. Um, so if you have a variety of uh sources where your income is derived from, so if you have you're a notary, you do real estate, you do food deliveries, you know, um, DoorDash and all of those things. Uber, Lyft, all of these different things are self-employed sources of income. And the reason that's important is if you have compiled all of your income into one um, platform where it's keeping all of that information, one booking keep keeping platform, um, what happens sometimes is when you hand that over to your tax professional, they, they're going to enter all that information in based off of what information you provide. And it's going to all be grouped under as, as a notary, right? Um, the reason why that could be an issue is, again, having cut ordinary and customary expenses might look inflated, right? It's like, whoa, you have a lot of mileage on here now, or you have a whole lot of office expenses all of a sudden. Um, you have some expenses that don't even align with a notary, you know, those types of things. Um, so it's important to make sure you're kind of identifying those sources of income, even if it means you're going to have a mult multiple Schedule Cs on your tax return. For those of you that are brand new and don't know what a Schedule C is, when you file your tax return as a self-employed individual um, or a small business uh, entrepreneur, you're going to have a Schedule C that identifies based on this um, industry and my where I earn this income from, this is all of my income, this is all of my expenses, and this is the, the bottom line for that. You will you may have multiple if you do multiple um, self-employed uh, positions, okay? Any, any, I thought I heard a question. No? Okay. So that's important. You want to you want to be able to break those up, make sense of them, even if it's just like two or three lines used on that Schedule C for that source of income. I'll, I'll give you again another example. So your Uber Lyft, you might have just what you paid in fees to them, just mileage, right? And um, what else can I think of? Or uh, maintenance on your vehicle. If that, that maintenance on your vehicle is greater than what the standard mileage is that the IRS would give you. Um, so not not a whole lot of expenses, but you want to be able to account for that for the Uber Lyft income. Okay. Glenn, can I yeah. interrupt you for one quick second? I don't want to get too far out of what you're talking about now. Okay. You do have two hands raised and they might pertain to what your topic is. Okay. Can we take yeah. those? Absolutely. Actually, okay, let's start with uh, Guy. First. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Ronnie? Is Ronnie oh, talking to us? Or yeah, is it mine's, okay. mine's actually not a question. Before you move on to the, the next slide, I actually wanted to point this out. You know, we've had uh, 130 people plus in here, and it, you know, right now, and I know that they'll get a lot of replays on this, but I want to point this out right now because taxes are hard for me. That's why Travis makes such a wonderful business partner for me because he he does that side of the business. 
And I just want to point out that there are some real big bets in the audience tonight. Uh, Jeffrey Clark, I'm just naming some names, Lori Morgan, Frida Mack, Nancy Fauché, Manuel Puga. These are people that have moved on. I mean, you know Laura Bieber's name. She's even here with us tonight. So, you know, this is a conversation that business owners have to have. And to yes. see some of these people that have moved on and that are running their business and then the vets also tuning in to have this conversation shows how important it is. And I know that there's a lot of, I see faces in here of notary stars that, and if I didn't name your name, I wish I could name everybody, but I only got like a minute. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I see people coming back for this conversation uh, that, and, and people who haven't been here in a few weeks because of traveling, all these things, this is an important conversation that business owners have to have. So I'm just so proud to see all these names coming in here uh, with people that I think are wonderful notaries, wonderful mentors, wonderful partnerships, wonderful teammates of other notaries around the country, seeing these names, you know, come in here and have this conversation. And I want to use that as an example and a point of reference for all notaries across the country, because I remember my first tax conversation. It was very uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, so if this is your first time, it's okay. You're surrounded by people who have gone on and grown their business and continue to, but this is a conversation you have to have with yourself and the IRS every year. So I'll leave it at that and we'll go to uh, Guy Chase's question. Glenn, you were talking about when you do a job and when you receive the payment. Will you be talking about the difference in how that works if you are doing accrual accounting versus cash accounting. Yes. Um, thank you. In fact, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. So the majority of us uh, receive or the majority of us in the industry do a cash accounting method when we prepare our tax return. And a cash accounting method basically means it's when the income um, was received or when the income was earned. Whereas mm -hmm. an, an, an accrual is when you have actually, um, you're accruing for that, you know you're going to get that money, and then you're actually accounting for it in the in the year, in the time frame you actually receive the income. So that happens many times. I'll give you an example. It's for construction workers, right? So they are contractors. Um, you know, they may have a contract with the the homeowner to say, I'm going to finish your job. It's probably going to take me, you know, eight, eight months or so, right? So they've given them some of the money in the beginning or maybe halfway, you know, half of that money at the beginning. And then the agreement is I'm not going to pay you until the job is done. And that might be the eight months. That eight months go rolls into the next year. So 20, now we're into 2024 and maybe I'm paying them, I don't know, next month, March, February or March. I'm going to, I'm going to account for the income in 2023 for half of that income I received, right, for the project, and the other half I'm going to account for, I'm um, sorry, depending on your accounting method, if you're doing cash, you're going to account for that all in 2023. If you're doing accrual, you're going to account for that in 2024 when all of the income has been received for that project. So does that answer your question, Guy? It's opposite of what I understood. Oh, cash. I've been saying it. Did I cash, say it wrong? Cash would be on a cash system, it would be reported when received or when incurred for the expense versus accrual being um, after the fact. So in what cash is, what does report, that for the fact mean? in cash reporting, if I did a job on December 28th. Uh -huh. I did not receive the payment mm -hmm. until January of 2024. On cash, I understood that that $200 would report it in 2024 as income, where if it was on the accrual, it would be reported in 2023. Okay, hold one second. Thought I have that in my slides. Let me move all of this out of the way. I might be saying it backwards. Hold on. And I apologize because I have no excuses. I have not eaten. <laughs> <laughs> Sugar's running low. I resemble that remark. I understand. <laughs> Bear with me. 
Mondays are kind of tough. We all kind of feel your pain. So uh, there you go. Yeah, bear with me. Hold on one second. I'm not saying I'm off camera because there's a Chick-fil-A sandwich right here. On <laughs> <laughs> not fair. Yeah. Okay. Give me one second. I'm going to do a stop share for just two seconds. And I know it's in one of my slides. So let me do a second here. I Ronnie, may the rule, Ronnie, the rule in school was if you bring something to eat to the class, you have to bring something for everybody. That's right. <laughs> Luckily, there's a Chick-fil-A on every corner now. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, can, uh, so did I not word that correctly? Okay, so what you're, what just, guy, just so we're on the same page. So the accrual method, yeah, means the recording, it, you're recording the expense uh, that was incurred uh, in the accounting period, but not paid until future accounting periods. Did I not say it in that way, in that example that I gave with the instruction? Well, the easiest way I understood it is if you're looking at a cash reporting system, you report the cash you received in the year you received it mm -hmm. and the expenses in the year you incurred it. So if I did a job in late December of 23, but did not receive the payment until 24, it would be reported as a 2024 income, not a 2023. For the accrual method? No, on the cash method. On the cash method. Okay, so maybe I worded that incorrectly, or maybe my example was bad because I said the half payment, right? Half for 2023 and half for 2024. I guess my question would be to you um, is in that example, how would you report that income? If it was half, if, if you were I, half, go ahead. If I did the job in December of 23 uh -huh. and I did not get paid until January of 24, I re would report that money in 2024. Correct. But now the, there's also construction based accounting, mm -hmm. which has an over and under billing provision. Okay. where you may overbill in one year and underbill in on a different year. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a mind-boggling calculation. I've done it many years past, two decades past, and I wouldn't want to try to explain it right now. Okay, But I Fair. think that would be what would more appropriately apply to your example of the contractor getting some money early in which case, if he has not done all of the work, he would have overbilled. Okay. And if then in the, uh, the next billing period, he did a substantial amount of work, but only billed for a fraction of it, that would be underbilling. And those have uh, offsets, one job to the next job, to the third job, to the fourth job. Mm -hmm. um, but like I say, it's been two decades or more since I was involved in that type of accounting work. Uh, but I don't think a, um, over under billing equates to cash businesses that operate on a cash business. That's cash agreed. Go ahead. So if I, I, if I, I hope if I can in interrupt real quick, I think to make it a little bit easier, Glenn, I think we're, the confusion is, is let's say on the 28th of December, you do a, you do a closing for a refinance. Okay. And you know that you're not going to get paid for it for approximately 30 to 45 days. So would that be income earned in the same year or would it be in the year of 2024? So the way that, the way that I understand it is you can write off your expenses and your mileage for the job that you did in the year that you incurred those. Right. When you get your check, let's say it's dated January 8th of 2024, then that would be income earned in 2024, not 2023. Am I uh, misunderstanding that? 
Go ahead. That's the way I understand it. So that's exact. That's exactly right. And so, and that's actually on one of my slides as well. As far as for some people who want to know, what about the, you know, the the signing service that did not pay me, right? For I went out, did the work, mm -hmm. and then now I'm chasing down this money and they've not paid me. You know, can I can I write that off? And what can I do? And is that a deduction? I touch on that on the next thing too. And I and to to that I say you you're not able to write that off. But you're able to write off the expense for getting there, you know, and, and you know, for mileage and, um, you know, supplies and things like that. Um, postage, if you had to pay for it, rarely we don't went through assigning services, labels and what have you. But um, so, yes, you can write those expenses off, but income earned would be reported in the year that it was actually uh, dedicated for. That and on I the think there was a it. question in the, the chat that was asking about a date. So when we were touching base on the payment date, it's going to be for the, the companies that are trying to write off that money for a December 28th payment. Mm -hmm. The check usually is dated 1230 or 1231. And you'll be receiving it oh, in Brian. January. And that mm -hmm. might be why you're seeing that income on the 1099. So in the very beginning of each year, you want to just look at your pay stubs and see if the check is dated in the year that you did the work or the year that you received it. And it's only really gonna happen in the beginning of the month or the beginning of January mm -hmm. each year for cash basis accounting. So I hope that clarifies so that we um, are making sure that we're looking at a couple of things. We're looking at how much each customer's paid us. And we're also looking at the dates of the check that we received in the beginning of January for the following year, because that will help you reconcile a 1099 that might not line up with what you've entered into your accounting or in your bookkeeping versus what you're receiving. So I hope that helped. And I didn't mean to jump in, but I hope that no, clarified that, no, that question about the payment date and stuff like that. So thank you so much, Glenn. I appreciate you. Yeah, no problem. And to, to no problem at all. So thank you. And to guys. And for that company, if, that's, that company that's writing things off in December of 23, their accounting is their accounting. When you receive the payment in 2024, that is your accounting. That does not mean that the two are the same or that they match. Correct. Good point. But again, most of us are on a cash accounting basis. If you're on an accrual basis, you you would likely know, and your tax you know professional that you're going to, you've likely discussed that the pros and cons to that, and you're aware, right? But if you most of us in this industry are on a cash accounting basis. Okay, so guy, did, did you did that answer your question, or did we have anything else? That's all I had. Okay. Thank you. One That's more right. question. One Sorry more that hand that they raised over here. Her arms yeah. were tired, Glenn. So, Nancy, do you want to unmute and ask your question? She actually just answered my question. Yay. Oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which which accounting method do we all typically use in this industry? Yeah. Oh, no. I did okay. uh, some closings back in September and October, and they failed to pay. And I contacted them. They went, sorry, and sent me a check. But the check I received in January, and it's also dated January, so I'm accounting for it as 2024 income. Okay. Right. Okay. And I just want to make sure that was right. I got a little confused there, but you fixed yeah. that confusion. <laughs> no <Thank> problem. <laughs> no problem. I think that's on one of my, um, here, don't hold on one second. Let me share it. Because we do talk about that. I do hear that from time to time as well. So. Okay, so we've got through, sorry, and if this is, if this runs long, because we've just gotten through slide six, so I'll go over this, and then we will answer any questions on this if you have any. So we're going to go good, right Glenn. Now. I don't have a full presentation side by side. I'm going to be answering questions about oh. how to record stuff, so you're okay with time. We're good? Okay, awesome. All right, so um, let's see. So self-employment taxes, okay, so not income taxes. I put that in there because uh, for those of us who are not familiar with taxes, um, we obviously pay different types of taxes. We all pay we all pay income taxes, even as notaries. Um, I've seen that in some forums where people get that confused with self-employment tax. Okay, um, so 
on this slide. Oh, I need to make this bigger again. Hold on. Yeah. I was just chatting you secret instructions. Oh, <laughs> okay. And then be from beginning, here we go. Okay. All right. Is that, a little, is that better? Perfect. Okay. So know your self-employment taxes. So self-employment tax rate is 15.3%. And of that 15.3% that we as uh, self-employed individuals pay, 12.4 uh, of that is Social Security and 2.9 is Medicare. So what we're putting aside to, for towards our retirement uh, when that time comes and being able to either pull, pull from Social Security and or other forms of retirement, pensions, et such, this is what you've been, uh, this is what you'll be paying towards the income that you report to the IRS, okay? This is a self-employment tax that again is a separate line on your tax return. It's not to be mistaken with things like income tax, um, capital gains taxes. Some people fall into what is called uh, alternative minimum tax, uh, corporation tax. Again, these are just examples. And then your state and local tax or SALT, uh, just to name a few, okay? Um, state and local taxes are paid uh, by just about anyone who has um, uh, state taxes, right? So the, the states that have um, state taxes applicable uh, to them, those would come, you would typically see that if we were all working for someone and were W-2 employees, you would see that as a state uh, taxes deducted from your income. Um, now, people who are fully self-employed um, uh, pay both parts themselves. So that's where I was kind of getting to the whole employer uh, typically pays your self-employment, you would pay your Medicare and Social Security tax. Well, we have to pay that as being self-employed individuals. Um, the income thresholds for 2023 uh, change a little bit because there, there's going to be an additional 9% Medicare tax rate if our, in, our your overall income. So you're now you're filing with your 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 husband, right? Or uh, maybe you're filing a single tax return. These are the income tax thresholds. Maybe you're head of household. You have some dependents. This is the income threshold for that, where this additional 9% would be applicable. Okay, 0.9% would be applicable. So the reason why it's important to know what your self-employment taxes are um, is because if you know what your self-employment tax rate is and you can project or at least forecast what you'll make that year or um, maybe compare it to previous years, you can start to make quarterly payments to the IRS so that you're not having to pay those taxes all at tax time, if at all. If you do it correctly and you say, okay, I project I'm gonna make this much. And I, if I compare the maybe the last couple of years even, um, this is how much I've had to pay. Let's say that came to, I don't know, $2,800 for the, for the year. You can, um, those can be uh, split into four payments that are made to the IRS that you can make your quarterly payments to. And then when you file your taxes and give it to your tax professional, you, you'll show them what your, um, what your estimated tax payments were that you made for the year. Okay, that'll be applied to your tax return. That um, tax professional is gonna be able to say, okay, well, great, because uh, in doing your taxes, you would have owed $3,200, but you paid $2,800 ahead of time, right? With those estimated tax payments. And so now you only owe the $400 difference. Okay. Okay, there was a hand. David. You're on mute, David. We're I all have guilty to of it. Let me unmute him for you. There you go, David. There you go. Okay. This is probably a stupid question, but if you're already on Social Security collecting, do you still have to pay the self-employment tax? Uh yes. So you're so, so yes. Yeah. <laughs> which is yeah. which is like being double taxed, but okay, you do. Yes, you do have to pay that on your self-employment tax. Well, one of the things is um, and I hear that a lot, and that's common, especially for individuals that are already retired and are kind of semi-retired because they're also doing, you know, that side gig, or maybe they even went back into the workforce, right? Um, so Social Security wasn't designed to, for any of us to retire and then go back to work. Right. They want they want to make sure you've paid in your taxes. And yeah, so good question. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay uh, I think I have another one. Heather, Miss Heather. Don't forget to unmute. Hi there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so if I'm just now starting out as a notary in that, when it comes to paying those quarterly taxes, um through like notary assistant, all of that. 
figuring out how would I figure out at the end of the quarter what taxes I need to pay quarterly because I'm just starting out. So okay. I haven't had yeah. any income yet. So good question. So essentially from, from this calculation here, right? If you just multiplied what you made for that quarter, okay, and then you can send that amount into the IRS just for simple math, right? I tell people, or you can round it if you want, um, but for simple math, you could do it that way. But typically it's over the course of the whole year. So what I would recommend is say, well, let's see how much I made. Um, oh, you said you're just starting out. Okay. Fair enough. So let's, yeah. Good. Okay. So fair enough. So if you took that amount and you estimate that you're going to make about that amount, because it's not going to be precise, you know, science on this, but uh, if you multiply that, you know, um, over the course of the year and you say, this is how much I'm going to make for the whole year, right? Uh, and then multiply it by that self-employment rate, you could essentially set that aside or send that okay. in uh, for your estimated payments. Um, okay. I have clients that do both. They'll either kind of plan on that and prepare for that at tax time because they know they're going to owe that. They don't want to really mail it in um, and, and send in estimated payments, but they, they set it aside and are prepared when tax time comes if um, they'll have to pay that. So you could do either or. Okay. All right. And because when you send it in, you just send in like a straight check and then they take care of dividing it up between Medicare, Social Security and that, or you're so good question. No, there's an actual estimated um, uh, tax pay payment form that could be that actually should be filled out because they'll have all the details or have your information. Okay. And then this way they know what, what Social Security number they're uh, you know, signing that to and what okay. estimated taxes that they receive and for what year, all of that. So there is a form and that's actually on the IRS.gov website um, and it's estimated taxes form. That's me. So you okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. You're I don't welcome. like doing taxes anyway because I'm a tax baby. <laughs> okay. So oh, it's okay. not my it's not my fun thing to do. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That's it's not okay. my birthday. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. Uh is it Anish? Anisa? Anisa, yeah. Miss Anisa. Anisa. Hi. Hi. Question for you. So the other gentleman's point about being retired and I do this full time now. So the monies that I end up paying, does that will that ultimately increase my social security that I get monthly? How does no. that work? So that's a question that you'll want to ask the social security office, but typically no. What you're paying into is for income earned now. Um, and once it's reported and if there's an increase to your income and what you're as a recipient, what you're entitled to receive, they would send you that information to let you know if it's increased. And it's my understanding that it only increases, if at all, once a year and you're notified of what that increase is. So it wouldn't be wow. something. Yeah, it wouldn't be something that would necessarily increase your taxes. And you'll find in this uh, industry that sometimes, um, especially in the first couple of years of business, you might have a loss where you don't even have to pay self-employment taxes because right. of your startup cost, right? Your expenses that you're um, writing against your income. Mm -hmm. Now it's brought your income, your taxable income down so low that you don't have to pay self-employment taxes. Okay. All okay. right. And not to you. get over anyone's head on that. I know that's a lot of information, but yeah, sometimes <laughs> it'll, <laughs> it'll cause it to be uh, where you want to have to even pay uh, self-employment taxes, depending on. You know, okay. Thank Glenn, you. we yeah. are really getting really close to the top of the hour. My question to you is to okay. continue with your PowerPoint presentation and get that information presented, or do you want to stick with questions from the gallery? Um, let me go through the PowerPoint if we okay. wouldn't mind, and then and I'll go through it quickly. Um, it, it is going to be uh, a lot of information, but I'll kind of highlight the top key points. Um, again, I'm sure Ronnie will have this information. Um, you know, available to, to the group. And then take correct? your time, Ms. Glenn, because here's the thing. We're recording this, so all of our members oh. get to watch that in, in their replays. Um, okay. So, you know, those who are not members will be able to, you know, stick around. If they okay. are able to, we'll get as much in it. But take your time. Let's let's get the conversation okay. out. Before we okay. go on, and mm -hmm. uh, I know that we have one hand raised, Catherine, if you could just leave that virtual hand up. Uh, but I do want to say this. Uh, Nisa was the last one who spoke, and I'm not doing a plug, I'm not trying to sell you guys anything, um, but Notary Assist is the only accounting software that I know of that allows for notaries to break out different- um, Categories of income. Yeah, different ways of making income. And Anissa really reminds me of that because 
I, and I don't want to be derogatory or anything, but Nisa's a hustler. <laughs> she really knows what she's doing out there and she's, you know, diversifying her income and, you know, a, a white glove notary at Unlimited Inc. when we can get her. She's got her own business going. She fills in her calendar with us, but I know she has multiple streams of revenue. And I think Notary Assist is a great software for notaries who are really diversifying. So I wanted to uh, just say that, you know, right here at the beginning, because it's the only one that I know of that allows for multiple streams of revenue to be, uh, and I'm sure you'll get to that in the presentation, Ms. Glenn, but I wanted to say that right now because she really jogged my memory on that. So I'll let you continue yeah. your presentation. Okay. Thank you. And I agree. I'll piggyback off of that. I think it makes life easier for everyone that is involved, including whoever you go to, to bring your taxes, to be prepared, to be able to say, so here's my different sources of income, and this is what I earned, and this is what I, uh, are my expenses, and this is what estimated taxes I may have made, you know, for, e for all of the categories or um, one of the categories. So yes, it makes life easier all the way across the board, and Not Notary Assist makes that possible. So agreed. Okay. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. Again, a lot of information. So do not get overwhelmed. We'll just talk about that real quick. Self-employment taxes. So, okay, let me see. I'm going to get rid of some stuff so I can see what I have here. Second. Okay. So common deductions. Um, so self-employment taxes, 50% uh, of what self-employment taxes you paid or are um, responsible for paying for that year is deductible on your tax return. Um, if you're going to a tax professional or a, um, uh, a firm, uh, the software that they use will automatically um, uh, account for that information. It'll be on the correct line and it will account for the 50% uh, deduction. Uh, home office deduction. This is a very common one. Um, I think a lot of people assume because they are home, especially um, you know since COVID and post COVID, um, a lot of people are working from home. So they want it, They want to take advantage of being able to deduct um, the the home office deduction. Um, I will kind of give you a heads up on that. That is one of the most common audited deductions um, that are out there. IRS audited, and the reason being is the how it's used. So it can only be for your business. That's that space that you use. It cannot be used for business seasonally and then, you know, um, a man cave during football season and a she shed during the holidays, right? It has to be dedicated and specifically for your business, that space that's used. Um, I will also share with you all that in my 22 years of doing taxes, um, I've only had one individual that was audited and it was because they were sharing their office space, um, but also was using it for entertainment space, right? So they had a big TV in there and then it would turn into something else. And yes, an IRS agent actually did come to the home wanting to see how the space was used after they had, had already sent in pictures that were requested by the IRS. Take a, take, a, take a picture of the space that you use and all that. Yeah, those things do happen. Um, long story short, obviously out of my control, what they had in their space, I don't know. I don't really care. Um, as long as they're following the guidelines and if they're ever audited, those are the things that are done. That's not to discourage you, any of you, from using the home office deduction. Um, as you can see here, it, you know, it, it's a lot of information. Feel free to read through some of that. But uh, the key takeaway is that, um, you know, th there, it can be up to $1,500 deduction for tw uh, for 2023. That's, uh, that's significant. That's a good amount of a deduction. Um, so I say use it if you know that you're basically not breaking any rules that the IRS guidelines has provided, right? So if you're, you're using it exclusively and only for your, off, your home office space, right? For your business to generate income, okay? If you're using it for anything else, um, you're risking you're risking that. And the other thing is the, I, the reason why it's one of the most commonly um, audited um, deductions is a, a lot of individuals will um, inflate their expenses, right? So your, your mortgage interest could be written off if you own a home, um, your rent, if you're renting, for those that are wondering, well, can I do it as a renter? Yes, you can. Um, so obviously, if you're putting that your rent is, I don't know, 
$3,500. And unless you live in San Francisco, <laughs> because that is actually common in some areas of San Francisco, um, you know, or if you have roommates or there's somebody else on the lease or whatever, um, those things would not be a red flag if you also generate income that kind of substantiates that you can at least pay a $3,500 rent. Does that, does that follow? I hope everybody follows with that. If you have a $3,500 rent that you're paying and the whole year you made $6,000, that's going to be a red flag, right? If you put on, on your taxes that you made $6,000, but you, you know, pay $3,500 a month in rent every month. Um, likely you have a roommate, likely it's a fraction of what you really should, uh, you're really paying in rent, et cetera. Um, so phone and internet, again, another common one. Uh, uh, first or only phone line is uh, not 100% deductible. And I say this because I actually just saw this question on a forum not too long ago. They said, does everyone have two phones for their, you know, for their business? Or do you guys just use one phone, a Google line? Do you have another phone, you know, another phone number that ranks to just the primary phone number that, or the primary phone you have? Um, you can do it however, whatever works for you. Um, I can tell you that the IRS is going to give you a deduction based on the business use of that phone. So if you have just one phone and you pay $100 a month for that phone, but you really only use it 30% of the time for business, you're only going to be able to write off 30%, right? For $30 per month in that in that example. Whereas if you have a second line and it's dedicated only for business, you get to write off 100% of the expense for that every uh, that you incurred every month. Um, health insurance premiums. So premiums you paid your spouse, children um, up to 27 years of age. Um, those are things that are also, again, deductible. Uh, same rule applies for uh, things like, uh, you know, dental health, vision, um, long-term care, that type of thing, long-term long -term, long-term, care premiums. And then meals, we're back to 50% deduction. I think uh, we had it for about a, two years or maybe a year, I can't even think now, um, where the meals was were 100% deducted, were deductible, as long as you actually had a sit-down meal, not like a drive-through or that type of thing, or, in, you know, um, and, and you discuss business. Right, so we're back to 50% deduction on that. So my example is a desk lunch is not deductible. Meal should not be extravagant, right? Um, what travel can you have lobster? Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A. <laughs> <laughs> you can have lobster as long as you're discussing business. So I think in that case, that would be okay. Extravagant being. Gosh, you two, and you have like, I don't know, a $700 bill and, you know, $350 of that is liquor. That oh, might... <laughs> that's a bad, that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> that probably wouldn't be so good. Um, so travel deduction. So again, another common one. Um, I think everyone mixes travel deduction with mileage. That's a common um, mistake. So mileage is mileage you um, have accrued in your vehicle or vehicles to conduct business, right? And to earn income. Um, travel is actually leaving your home and staying overnight, typically out of your city or your state um, and having to pay for uh, lodging, right? For the room, yeah, transportation to and from the, uh, the destination, like an Uber or a taxi. And then again, the meals is 50% deduction. So travel is actually leaving your home out of your city, maybe a conference, a notary conference, an NNA conference, those type of thing. Yeah, those things get deducted, right? Um, if you went to some type of seminar or something to better improve your notary skills and 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 what have you, also deductible. Um, vehicle deduction, AKA mileage. So right below that. So we're at 0.65 miles uh, per mile that the IRS gives us as a, as, as, as a deduction for actual expenses. It's a little different. I'm gonna talk about that. So when you file your tax return, you have one of two options. You're either going to take what the IRS gives everyone for a vehicle um, mileage deduction, which is 65 cents per mile. And that adds up very, very fast in our industry, right? Because we drive to everybody since we're mobile. Um, or actual expenses. So your actual expenses, uh, again, could be tires, uh, maybe you had to get brakes done, I don't know, um, 
you know, transmission, something that's going to be significant and add up and will likely be greater than your vehicle mileage deduction. The goal here is to take the larger of the two, either the standard mileage or your actual expenses. Okay. Can you switch between the two? You can. Um, in the first year, typically you'll want to do actual. Good question. In the first year, you'll want to do actual expenses. Um, um, excuse me, standard mileage expenses so that if you need to switch to actual, you can do that years two and beyond. And you can uh, you can switch back and forth. Whereas if you did it in the first year as actual expenses, I believe in, unless this has changed, the IRS had a rule at one point that if you chose actual expenses in the first year, your actual expenses all the way until you basically dispose of that vehicle. But I'll, do I'll double check on that. But yeah, you can you can typically switch uh, from standard to actual. All right. So that any questions on that? Should I grab the hands real quick? Let's start with uh, Catherine. There you go, Catherine. You should be able to unmute now. Okay, great. So um, quick, I have two questions now because of the health insurance thing came up. So okay. um, the health insurance, so I pay it privately, but it's through Covered California. Okay. Um, so how does, does that apply? Like, yes. for the whole family? So, yes, it, it applies. But as you know, there, that's, um, it's, it's, uh, subsidized essentially. So it lowers your premium, right? Um, so there's another tax form for that. So not to confuse you anymore, but there is another tax form that would be applied to your tax return just to see that when you didn't exceed what they kind of gave you ahead of time, right? In advance in credit. Oh. Um, to offset those premiums. Um, and, and if you did not exceed that, then yes, those insurance premiums would be uh, deductible on your on your tax return. Cool. Okay. And then totally beating a dead horse again about the whole, like I worked and, you know, I did a, an appointment at the end of November, but then I just got paid today and I use Notary Gadget. This is my first year. And so okay. I do Notary Gadget. I didn't know anything about Notary Assist until actually just now. And so I'm trying to figure this all out because I was doing the end of year reports and the payment I put in today still went on 2023, not the 2024 reports. So when you were saying that we need those certain reports, you know, printed out to do the taxes, mm -hmm. um, it, so it went on 2023 because, because I, because that's when you earned the income because that's and when that's, I did the actual service. Correct. And that's kind of what guy was getting to. And I think Sue had uh, said something as well. And what guy was saying towards the end of um, his comments were it's not so much the signing services accounting method and how they do business. That's going to align with your accounting method when you 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 file your tax return. They could be on a totally different accounting method, but your accounting method is is cash, right? right? So if you're you're entering that information, the software should have acknowledged that yeah, that was income earned in 2023, right? Right, and it was paid now. And unfortunately, the terms, net terms, and all of that is 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 not as applicable when it comes to accounting methods in this case where you're receiving the money. And you're receiving it in February, but that was for 2023 income. Right. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. So I was just wondering if we just simplify it based on we, 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 if we the day that we do the service, that's when the year that it should be applied. It, like, simply. depending on the, yes, depending on the account. I know that's confusing. Depending okay. on the accounting <laughs> method. So yeah, if you're cash accounting, that is correct. Right. To, okay. Okay. Okay, so the accrual method, not to confuse anyone, but that's kind of what, what was being said earlier is that the accrual method basically says you're going to account for it when it's actually received. And how do you know what method per individual that they use? Okay, um, so in, I want to say a notary gadget, it defaults to cash accounting. You might want to check on your settings, but I'm pretty sure it's cash accounting. Okay. You can, you could switch it to accrual. Um, but even when you file your tax return, yeah, you'll have to let your tax professional know what what accounting method you use. Okay. But it, I believe the defaults to cash. You're welcome. Cash. Okay. <laughs> no worries. You're fine. Uh, who was next? Miss Eva. You're going to have to unmute. There we okay. go. 
She's locked Hello. Glenn. I have to I have to unlock her just to be able to have her be able to unmute. Oh, so you'll okay. say their name. Give me one second to get her unlocked. And then, oh, okay. So. Yeah. Okay, no I'm on. Am I locked? You're live. You're live. Okay. Um, deductibles. When I pay my tithes to my church, I take it from my business account as well. I take it from the total amount that I get. I do my 10%. Am I able to write that under my business? No. So that's an itemized deduction. And again, not to confuse anybody else uh, in the group and to get over too many people's heads here. Um, but a few years ago, under a different administration, there were changes made uh, in the IRS coding to basically limit individuals from um, limiting the amount of taxpayers that are using the itemized deduction option versus standard deduction. Um, the objection, the, uh, the goal when you itemize is that it exceeds whatever your standard deduction is that the IRS gives you, depending on your filing status. So if you're single, um, give me a second, because I don't think I added that on the, on the PowerPoint. Give me two seconds here. But if you were, if you're single and you, uh, your filing status, I'm sorry, your deduction is, here it is, here it is, here it is. Got my, and there's so many seminars, I can't keep all these numbers in my head now. Okay, let, I'll just give you an example because I can't find it right now, but uh, single status, I think is like 12,500 or 13,000. So if you filed your tax return, the goal would be all of your itemized deductions would exceed that 12,500 deduction, right? Including those, um, charitable donations and, and tithes that you pay to the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, but to answer your question specifically, you cannot write that off on your business tax return because that is an itemized deduction only. So what would I write it off on? My regular tax returns? You would write it on your tax return if you, if you itemize your deductions, if you include things like mortgage interest that you deduct, property taxes that you de uh, can deduct. Uh, okay. that's that salt that I was giving you, the state and local tax, those types of things that are deducted. Um, if if you do that, then yes, you could. Okay, I do do that. Okay. Perfect. All right. Thank Great you. Great questions, Eva. Great questions. Yeah, Thanks so questions. much. Um, do you want to finish your slides, Glenn, or do you want to just um, ask questions? I think we're, any, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer uh, Leah's question. I think she's next. Miss Leah? Actually, Miss Glenn, before we go through that, how about we have some questions held to the end? Because we're we're about seven fifteen, which is uh, about ten fifteen East Coast time. Oh so gosh, yeah. Let's uh, let's um, let's move get on to the next. Yeah, let's move on to the next. And by the way, guys, Glenn has got her contact information. If you could put that into the chat really quick for us, just type it in for anybody yeah. that wants to e email you. If you could type that in, and then let's hold those questions to the end because. That way uh, we can get through these slides because I know I know Gwen wants to answer everybody's question and she won't mind answering some emails. Um, and then while we're waiting, okay, oh, she put it into the chat, everybody. So I'm gonna star it here. I'll give the little notary star on it. And Miss Sue, while you're waiting, I did tag you in a comment that I want to make sure I didn't uh, represent your company differently. So if you could scroll back up, I tagged you in it, uh, and I've been trying to get you to. I texted you and everything. So uh, if you could. Hop in there and do that, and then we'll let Miss Glenn get through her uh, slides really quick. Okay, uh, so I'll go through this real quick too. So interest deductions, uh, things like you, you know, if you have business loans, um, and you pay interest on that, those are things that can be deducted. Credit card interests uh, that are uh, that are dedicated to again your business, so not your personal credit card interest. Um, so for your, uh, business purchases and such, or if you have a business credit card, the interest you pay on that, uh, dues and publications. So magazines, journals, uh, trades, right? All of the subscriptions we pay for NNA is an example, uh, the memberships and fees for that notary assist is an example, whatever those monthly fees are, um, you would deduct that education deduction. So training, um, for any required co course to, again, to enhance your skills as a notary, um, or seminars and such that you've been to, um, you can deduct that as well. Your commission renewal, again, that's a missed one. Um, business insurance, so your E&O, your bond, your professional liability insurance, also deductible. 
um, rent deduction, again, for office space that you might pay for. So if you uh, pay for an office space somewhere in a, in a maybe a, a shopping mall or something like that, right? Or in a business industry, business location, you can go ahead and uh, you can deduct the rent that you pay, your portion for that. Uh, startup costs. So this is another big one. So up to $5,000 in your first year of business, um, tax deductible startup costs. Um, it includes your, you know, your market research, your travel. You, you see all of that information there. Um, another common one that people forget is if you, uh, if you initiated your LLC or you paid someone to help create your LLC, uh, that's a deduction. And then the renewal for that, like for in California, um, typically it's $800 a year regardless if you made money or not. Unless you dissolve that business, that's a, a fee that California um, wants you to pay to, to run a business out of California. Uh, so those are, again, common things. Advertising and marketing, right? So are your prepaid ads on social media forums, Google, local events, all your digital marketing, your business cards, et cetera, right? Um, that's also a deduction. Uh, retirement plan contributions. So these are things uh, that you may have set up um, so that you can contribute towards your retirement. Okay. Those are things that you can deduct. And then again, they, they all kind of have a different amount based on um, your filing status. Um, office supplies. So pens, paper, postage, right? Printer ink, toner. I was trying to think of all the things that we, we get as notaries. Um, thumbprint. Thumbprint log, scanners, all that good stuff. Uh, I don't think I miss any there, but if you can think of any, again, if it helps in you, um, you know, building your business and being able to drive income from the notary business, uh, you can likely write it off. Okay, so that's that. And before we go into the Corporate Transparency Act, should I answer any questions at all now on from, or should I move forward? You let me know, uh, Beth or Ronnie. Um, Corporate Transparency Act, I think, is important to at least mention it because we know a lot of LLCs are, are going to be required to do this, and it has a deadline of January 31st, so we want to get that in. So, yes, please. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so I don't think I had a chance to update this slide right before because as of January 1st, it's available on the um, FinCEN website. Actually, I might have. Let me see. Yeah, I did. Okay. So here we go back. Uh, can I go back this way? Nope, that's on the actual website. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, bear with me. <laughs> okay, let's stop sharing for just a second and we're gonna share that again. Okay, so Corporate Transparency Act, let's do the little slide from beginning. Why are you doing that? Why won't it take me to where I need to go? Good grief. Okay. One more time, guys. I know it's late, so I'm going to try to get through this real fast here. Am I sharing now? Let's see. Not yet. Okay, I think I'm going to go back one slide from before I share this screen. Maybe that's the deal. While you're pulling this up, I actually want to tell people why this is important or why I think it's important. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but all those bad signing agencies out there that we don't know who owns them, uh, the Corporate Transparency Act, which we all have to do as well, you have an LLC, is going to stop people from being able to hide behind a name because you're going to have they're going to have to report who owns that company. Uh, is that a is that along the lines of correct, Miss Glenn? Yes, that's actually uh, right on. Um, that's why I'm all for it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I have to reopen up the PDF here one second. While you're doing that, Glenn, I want everybody to direct their attention to the chat. There's two websites I threw in there for you. One is the one I think Glenn had up on one of her slides, 
just gives you information on who's required to report. And then the second one is the actual link on where to report your status. Outstanding. Yes. And both of those links are in. Uh, thank you so much for doing that, Beth. And hopefully now you guys can see this. Um, and in a bigger portion. Let's see. Oh, ah! there should definitely be a way to go back right here. Aha. Okay. Thank you again, guys. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. So uh, what is it? It's the requirement by the government to submit your beneficial ownership uh, report. What does that mean? It basically is information about you or whoever the beneficial owners are of your company um, that make decisions on behalf of the company that impacts your finances, your financials, right? So um, that information is going to be things like your driver's license, your address of, and your address of where the business is. Um, it's some really basic, basic and common information that quite honestly, they probably already have between having filed our tax returns, having to get commissioned, we had to provide our driver's license, you know, all of these different things. Um, but it's going to be required across the board uh, to essentially prevent fraud and covering behind names and bogus names and names that, um, you know, are not legit, right, in operating a business. Um, and and foreign entities as well. Um, so this is effective January the 1st, so just, just about a week ago. Um, if your business was formed before January, January the 1st of this year, you'll have till the end of this year, December 31st, to comply with this requirement, okay? Um, if the business was formed after January the 1st of this year, you'll have 90 days from when you formed your, your business, okay? Uh, typical ones are... LLCs and corporations, S-Corps and C-Corps. Um, I'm going to skip this part because I think this gets confusing because initially that's what the information was that the IRS had posted on the website and then it changed a little bit because that's where we were going and then Finson was saying, you know, wait, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, right? Um, so now if you were to go to this website, which I believe Beth dropped into the chat, I point out just here where you would click, because there's a lot of information on this page and it gets a little overwhelming to say, what am I supposed to do? What am I filling out, right? If you just click on the beneficial ownership information report, it's gonna open up another uh, page and that page is gonna look like this, okay? Again, a lot of information, feel free to, you know, peruse through that if you want to, but here are your key places that you're going to look at. But the uh, one you'll want to do is how do I file this beneficial ownership information? Okay. How do I file? You can click on that. It'll give you more information. Um, and then from there, it's pretty, self it's pretty intuitive. What information you'll need to fill in, what information you need to provide, be prepared to upload some of that documentation that supports that. Again, driver's license, um, and um, I'm not sure if the social security is one of the, the documents that it requests to verify you. Um, you can, you know, it'll ask you and you'll know what information you'll need to provide. So again, you'll wanna have that information handy to upload that kind of a, makes it all complete. Um, you'll submit that information. You'll receive a, a confirmation your information was received and is being processed. And then I believe the last step is that it's uh, your information's you know, received and confirmed. Um, I do want to say that if you're not comfortable doing this or you worked with someone that helped you establish your LLC, um, they could also do this for you on your behalf. Okay, if you prefer to do that. It's actually very simple. Um, I think like all things it was made to be like, oh, it's this huge, big thing. But again, if we're all being honest, the government has all of our information, right? Mm -hmm. um, we go to the DMV to get our driver's license. You know, we get our, we have to go to the social security office to get our social security card. You know, if all of your information is legit and you didn't open up your LLC under your granddaughter's name, right? Or your five-year-old grandson's name, and these types of things to, to um, Ronnie's point, then it'll be a non-issue, okay? Um, so that's how you, we go to that. Um, there's no cost to submit that. 
that information. Um, it is a requirement and there's no cost to do that. The fines and penalties, so up to $10,000 fine or $500 a day, uh, if not compliant um, and uh, submitted by the applicable dates, okay? And up to two years of imprisonment. So they're taking this pretty seriously, which again, to Ronnie's point, I'm glad they are. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> who is a beneficial owner? Again, this is someone who owns or controls at least 25% of your company's interest. They exercise substantial control, such as decision-making. So the CFOs, the CEOs, as uh, again, self-employed and business owners, many of you might be CEOs of your companies or a president or all three of these titles, all of these officers. <clears throat> has the ability to appoint and remove such officers. Um, so again, someone who uh, can make some pretty important decisions on, on behalf of the company and, um, you know, impacts your financials at the end of the day, at the end of the year. Uh, the report includes all owners, um, AKA members, full name, birth date, current addresses, images of acceptable identification documents. Yeah, passport and driver's license. So no social security card. So those are the things that it's going to ask for to verify you. Um, I don't know, because someone had already asked me this. What if my information that I'm now inputting into this website changed from the information I have on my driver's license, right? So I moved. Looks like it doesn't, it doesn't jive. It doesn't make sense and it doesn't align. Um, I don't think that that's so much an issue because I'm sure they're well aware people move. And now you've got current information you're adding into there. It's more so getting that driver's license ID number, right? Um, I'm sure as part of their the fraud department's um, um, process is to verify that all of that information you just entered is legit. It makes sense. I don't think they care if it's expired. I don't think they care if the address has changed. Um, again, validating that the information is correct. And then who is exempt? It says uh, here, most small businesses are not exempt. So that's us, small businesses, we're not exempt. Um, publicly traded, nonprofits, uh, and then there's 23 different types of entities that you can find on the FinCEN website of those that um, are exempt from having to report this information. Okay, there's the website. Um, did you happen to drop that in the chat as well, Beth? Um, I've got the website and the BOI website, but Wonderful. some people are saying that it appears I click on it and it goes right to it. Others are saying that it's spelled wrong, but it isn't. It's www.fincen.gov forward slash B-O-I. Correct. Yeah. And then you, you can add to that the dash FAQs, frequently asked questions. Um, okay. If you want to kind of just see what those are. Uh, exempt entities are. And I actually yeah. just tested it. I was really hoping it wouldn't accidentally uh, in this meeting because I'm the one who started it. And uh, even though it says suspicious, like it does take you to where you're supposed to go. So thanks, Beth, for doing that. And then I'm also pointing the FAQs in there now. Uh, when I try to click on it, because I posted it, it doesn't uh, give the suspicious link, but it is a valid link what Beth posted and what I posted as well. Okay. But I had to I had to mark it and say it's okay, go ahead. I don't know why it does that, but that is weird. Yeah, it 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 is a valid link and it goes straight to that website. Okay. Perfect. I took a chance, guys, but it, I'm glad that you all that were chatting back and sending me text messages. I'm glad that you weren't taking chances with your computer. Um, because I know Notary Assist and Glenn Hill would get me a new computer tomorrow if, <laughs> if, if I that was the case. <laughs> <laughs> And then I'd we only can get eight. No. She said only eight <laughs> laptops <Yeah>. a year. <laughs> if you want to buy me eight laptops, I'll give you my address in the chat. <laughs> All right. So now finding a tax professional. Um, I'm going to briefly go through this as well, and then we'll answer questions. I haven't forgotten you guys, I promise. Um, so things to consider. So here's on the IRS website. Um, you can go to this IRS website, and in the search bar, if you just want to type in find tax pro or, or, you know, find a tax professional, right? In that upper right search bar right here, you can do that. Or here's the very long link. Um, I may be able to drop that into, I don't know, nope, I can't. And of course, but here's, here's the link for it. When you go to the IRS website, you can just put it in there. Um, and then about halfway, whoops, 
about halfway in the page there, there's another hyperlink that shows, you can search by zip code, right? You can search by a tax professional's name to see um, if they're still in business or someone you used to go to or someone that was recommended. Um, you can look into that and then I'll show you their status if they're active or not. Um, it's my understanding that someone can be inactive marked inactive if just they've not updated their credentials. And we're required every year to update uh, and per, uh, attend uh, classes and courses to keep our credentials um, you know, up to date and current. Okay, so things to consider. What hours of operation is that is that individual working? Are they, you know, are they accept are they accessible? Are they only are they only open during business hours where we're getting home seven, eight, nine, ten o'clock at night. Um, and we might want to send them an email or ask them a question. I probably wouldn't email or text somebody at, you know, nine or 10 o'clock at night, but you get what I'm saying. If you're wanting to talk to someone, right, live, uh, would that be, would that be some doable? Um, you'll want to find someone that's registered and bonded and insured, right? So we're all bonded, right? We're all insured. And for, you know, all intents and purposes, we're commissioned, we're registered. Um, and I say that because if you go to someone, you know, that you're, cousins, brother, aunt, uncle's been going to for years, um, and they don't have e-file privileges, um, chances are it was revoked. It was denied or revoked for whatever reason. Um, that's not a good sign, right? Um, it could be because they, they didn't they didn't pay for their bond, right? Um, they're not registered for whatever reason. Um, and you want to know that someone is up to date on their credentials and the understanding of tax code and tax laws that have changed as year over year and how that would apply to your tax scenario. Um, do they have experience with notary um, and self-employment tax returns, right? Um, many tax professionals, of course, are familiar with self-employment taxes and, and Schedule Cs and how to prepare tax returns in that way. Um, but if they don't know that our notarial acts are not taxable for purposes of self-employment taxes, right? In some states, it's a, at a set rate, like in California, it's for $15 per, per signature, right? Um, and if they don't know to exclude that from your income, you're, you're overpaying taxes. You're overpaying self-employment taxes. So it's important to know that you're going to someone that knows about that exemption, that self, that no, notary exemption um, for self-employment tax, okay? Uh, so submitting and receiving communication of docs. How are, how are they asking you to submit their, your documents to them? Is it an upload through, um, what's the most common one of, um, Dropbox or Google Drive or some secured site um, or even one of their secured sites um, to be able to get that information to them, right? If we live in a day of fraud, there's a lot of fraud. You don't want your information going into the wrong, you know, fax number or the wrong um, email, right? Or whatever the case may be. You want to make sure that it's a secured email, secured way of getting that information to them. If you're not meeting with them in person, of course, that's a common one, or mailing your documents to them directly. Um or dropping them off to them directly. Uh, fees, uh, do they charge per tax or per tax form or per line? Um, this is this was more of a practice many, many years ago. Um, even the larger tax preparation um, businesses have kind of gone away from that because they, they very quickly realize that customers are, are getting pretty savvy and are very smart that they don't want to pay you know, per line, per form and everything I bring you, you're charging me for it, right? Um, when I can go to someone else and maybe have a flat rate based on what type of tax return I'm going to have. Um, current with all tax education requirements, I, I mentioned that. Storing your tax return and your tax stocks, are, are those are in a secured location? Um, are your, hopefully your taxes aren't being saved in a folder in that business, home business office that everybody can can see and have access to, right? Um, hopefully it's in a, in a locked safe or a locked file cabinet or even in a storage facility. Um, you know, in a box or something like that. that. Basically not accessible to everybody and it's safe. Um, accessibility and support if you need it. I uh, kind of redundant there, but you guys get it there. Um, and then are they an EA, a CPA, or, um, you know, registered with the IRS to be able to uh, pre prepare tax returns to begin with? Again, I uh, you can go to people um, and companies that do your tax returns and if you still feel like that just doesn't seem right, it's okay to get a second opinion. 
taxes is a major thing and it is your financials it is your 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 finances in, including with your family and and you know your husband and wife uh, and their income as well so if you're not feeling comfortable um, I say have somebody else take a look at them and hopefully whoever you went to understands um, and will um, respect that okay um, so there's that and then I think the last slide was questions so Miss Glenn, um, yes. before we go into questions, first of all, I want to say that there is a lot to talk about with taxes, right? Like we went mm -hmm. over a lot and we're about an hour and a half in. Um, before we go into questions, I did just post in the chat again. If you don't get your question answered tonight, uh, you can email uh, Glenn as well. Um, she, she, you know, she's here for the notary community. But I also wanted to uh, have notary says come up because I know that we want to hear some things from them as well. And then at the end, because, uh, you know, it's getting later on that East Coast time, yes, I, I'm so I sorry. want to kind of hear from both parties. But first of all, you've done an amazing job, and I think everybody should give Miss Glenn a, a big Notary Stars wave. You know, Thank uh, you. I, this is a, a, a long and tough yeah. conversation because there's a lot to talk about with taxes. Mm -hmm. um, but if we can uh, unshare the screen for a moment, and let's yeah. also hear from Notary Assist on this and what, Absolutely. and what we think about taxes and what we can do. And by the way, guys, I've been posting the chat. If you haven't uh, uh, seen it in the chat, on the 22nd, Notary Assist is coming back to go over their full accounting software with you again and all the updates that they have available. Uh, but Miss Sue, let's hear what you think about taxes and anything that you want to add to the conversation tonight. And then we can go into any Q&A for, for the rest of the night. Oh, well, everybody loves taxes. I mean, come on, there's so much fun and there, there's no stress or anxiety. I mean, I've watched the chat and everybody's like, oh my God. <laughs> and, it's, and, and you're not alone. I think that's what I wanted to say more than anything is that this is a community. And I was so excited to connect with Glenn. She's a notary like we are. She, she understands our, you know, our, our day and what we do. And it's so important to work with somebody who understands our um, our industry so that you can maximize your savings and maximize your, your benefits. And just so you know, the one thing I will say is taxes are unique to every single one of us. They're like fingerprints. N none of us are the same. None of us are going to file the same. We might have an LLC, or we might file as a solopreneur, or we might have an EIN number. So every single one of you are going to set up your businesses as unique as you are. So try to not look at each other. Don't the one big mistake I think that a lot of people make is you talk about taxes to your friend and you're, oh, I got so much money back, or I paid so much. And then you start doubting yourselves. If I can say one thing, find a Glenn. Okay, find a Glenn so you can have a partner in your business. It's super important that will help guide you through what is important for you and your goals and your business, because that's it's it's a big part of running your business. Now, when I started Notary Assist back in 07, I had no idea about any of this. None. Okay. I was just a little, and everybody gets mad at me when I say just a notary. I was just a notary who was just seeing that there was a need for some software. I had no idea how to run a business, no idea what to do. And when you got into it, I'm like, there's a lot of pitfalls. There's a lot of potholes. There's a lot of curves thrown at you. I didn't know about filing quarterly. I didn't understand any of that. Um, but thankfully, I've been able to have amazing colleagues like Glenn guide me through how to set up a business and how to categorize my expenses. What is it? What is deductible? What's not? What should I call it? What shouldn't I call it? Because let me tell you, I've had many revamps since I started. And it's something that's going to constantly evolve. You're going to get better at it every time you do it. It's practice, right? The sad thing is, is that there's a lot of stuff that we only do once a year. So you never remember. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't remember this. But hopefully we're going to give you some tools and some sense of community so you're not alone and you don't feel overwhelmed. The best thing to do is to start early. The earlier you start, the more organized you can be, the more clarity you'll have 
into each one of your unique tax journeys. So uh, that's all I really wanted to say is, is it don't feel, give yourself grace. Don't overwhelm yourself. It's, it's a challenge, but it's not unaccomplishable. I don't even know if that's a word. I just made it up. But anyway, we can accomplish great things together. And I appreciate you all being with us so light in the evening. And I, on your East Coasters, you're like the bomb. So thank you. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm here and I'm coming back to Notary Stars in February to talk about how Notary Assist can help you organize and stay on task. So I appreciate you all. And thanks so much for hanging out and learning about taxes. Woo -woo -woo. Yes. And uh, by the way, guys, I just want to remind you, there are three dots on the bottom of the chat. If you click on those three dots uh, all night long, we've been posting, you know, uh, replies to questions. Sue's been replying to questions. If you question to get answered, we're going to take the questions on the screen right now. Uh, but you can click those three dots and download the, the chat and uh, get the answers to those questions. We've also been posting when Notary Assist is coming back, how to access their last presentation, which by the way, you will want to come on the 22nd because it's going to be a brand new presentation. This company has grown like wildfire, okay? I mean, it's it's grown and it, it's got a lot of software like recording uh, multiple streams of revenue uh, for notaries, which is a, a, a facet that no other accounting software offers for notaries. So. Um, let's get to these last two questions on the screen here, Miss Beth, and then I just need to give praise ahead of time so everybody sees it. For Glenn, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, we're going to have to turn this into a more regular series, but one of the things in the chat is Glenn and Sue get together every month and write a tax tip for Notary Stars, and they update those tax tips every month, and you can learn about them and learn these tactics You know, every single month at Notary Stars in our Facebook group, you know, our Instagram, we post them on our LinkedIn. Um, we are so grateful that they are providing this for us. This is not Beth and I or Travis writing tax tips for you guys. This is Notary Assist and Glen Hill coming every month to give you a tax tip. So it's on the blogs and it's in the chat. Um, so we'll go to the, the last couple of questions. Leah, you are up next for a question here. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, so luckily I wrote my question down because I would have forgotten it otherwise. <laughs> um, first of all, let me start by saying, um, Ms. Glenn, you were amazing. Excellent, excellent information. Thank you so much for taking this time out to share with us tonight. Um, now to my question, because I know there's other people waiting. Um, at the point when I had the question, was in regards to um, actual expenses versus, versus mileage. Okay. Um, now you mentioned that you can use stuff like oil change repairs, um, major work for the vehicle or major or minor work that you have to do for the vehicle. However, I did not hear you mention anything about car payments. Is that something that could be considered as a deduction? No, unfortunately not. So always think of taxes as interest and taxes, right? It's just, just, to, just to simplify things. Um, so tax payments aren't deductible um, in the way of uh, actual expenses, unless it's a lease. So if you okay. lease it, then you can, you can write off the lease payments. Okay. Thank you. And then a really quick follow-up question to that is, um, it's kind of in the same circle, but just wondering if you could clarify for me. So it, within the last year I had to, um, change cars in which it, in order to do so, I would require me to put a down payment on the newer vehicle. What mm -hmm. about with the, the down payment towards a newer vehicle? Could that be counted towards any type of deduction or expense? Um, so putting a down payment on your vehicle, could that be counted as a deduction? Are you using that vehicle strictly for business? No, it's not strictly business. No, um, you wouldn't be able to because again, it's now what you're doing is you're crossing over into personal and business mm -hmm. and Again, typically the things that you can write off are things like, again, if lease payments, interest that you pay. So you might want to look to see what your interest is, what your interest was that you paid on that registration that you may have had to pay. I'm not sure what state you're in, but to register your vehicle um, insurance on that vehicle. Okay. So, but even, even if that vehicle is not 
specifically a business vehicle, I could still look into the registration or the insurance yes. for that vehicle for deductions. Yes, yes cuz it'll take a portion of, of of what you've indicated is actually used for business. So, uh on the tax return when you file it, it's going to uh it, I think it actually asks you depending on uh, the software, so you're depending on who you're going to, but typically it will ask you what percentage of that vehicle is used for business and if it's 20%, 30%, etc. That's how much of what you've entered would be deducted, or that's what you actually can't, depending on the software, what you're actually entering as your actual dedu deduction. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. You're Sounds welcome, like you're my great. pleasure. Great job. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, uh, who's next? Sophia. Hello, Sophia. Okay. okay, how you doing? Um, Lisa, I, am also a certified registered tax preparer been in it in the business since 2009 and being a tax preparer is what made me be, become a notary yeah. one of the things mm -hmm. that i have uh come across and i want all of our notary stars to know is make sure that because i have uh, i don't know at least 50 percent of my clients are out of state and you need to make sure that they're using a secured form to send you your paperwork and make sure that they send it to you and it gets in and it's signed because I don't send anyone's taxes until they've given me my, my signed documentation. And I've noticed that I've gotten a lot of clients over the years and a couple of notaries just because they've gone through some un unsecure ways of getting their information um, given to them. You know, also, you know, by what it was about five years ago, they made us all take that certified tax preparer test and mm -hmm. everyone had a fit. You know, and a lot of us are still certified because we went through that, paid that fee and, you know, wind up making sure that we kept up on on our schooling and education. So please, right. please make sure that you guys, as you guys are out there looking for uh, tax repairs, please make sure you actually have someone who can, who knows what the, your deductions are. You can't just mm -hmm. give them the information. They should be also being able to give you information. And if Anyone wants to just Google me and call me and ask the question, I'm open just like Lisa. I'm Glenn, by the way. I'm sorry, Glenn. That's okay. <laughs> I, was, no, I was waiting. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. You're totally fine. You're totally fine. Yes, good point. I think I did mention that. Making sure you're sending it through a secured way. Um, you, that's a very good point, Sophia, because again, with fraud and everything that's going on out there, you don't want to send it to the wrong individual. You don't want to send it through a wrong, you know, um, method of, uh, you know, submitting that information. Good point. Thank you. Who's next? Was there anyone else? So Fia was maybe the last one with their hands up. That is it. Well, I appreciate all of you for sticking around and I know it's late. Um, I hope this information was insightful and, and helpful and and all of that good stuff. It was a pleasure to be here with all of you. You know what, Miss Glenn, I'm going to tell you something. I learned something tonight too. First of all, the last time that we did this presentation, it was a, a little bit shorter. And here's the thing, I'm not complaining. Uh, there's a lot of information to go over. And, you know, we just had an update this year about, you know, the uh, Corporate tr Tax tr uh, corporate tax Transparency uh, Act. I think that's what it's called. I'm going to have to go back and rewatch it. But there's so much information to go over, and we have to do this once a year. You know, some of us might have to do it quarterly and report and all those things, but it is something that we all have to do as business owners. So I appreciate all the information that you brought. Um, your information is in the, the chat. Uh, Beth put it in there as well. I want to remind everybody that uh, Notary Assist, which is the only accounting software that we know of that allows you to break up multiple streams of revenue, which a lot of you notary stars do, is coming back on February 22nd. So mark your calendar. Of course, you know I'm going to send out the emails to remind you but I do need to ask all of you to please turn on your cameras because we get these two once, maybe once and a half, 1.5 times a year. Um, they do work behind the scenes writing uh, tax tips for you, but I need you to turn on your cameras. If you are not naked and you are not <laughs> stuffing your face with a sandwich right now, please turn on those cameras because we have guests in the house and we want to give them our signature wave so that we can send them off this evening and thank them. And this is how we thank people at Notary Stars by showing our love just like if we were at church we'd walk over and shake somebody for coming in on sunday so let's get those digital cameras turned on for just a moment let's give our signature wave 
Thank you, Ms. Glenn, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Ms. Sue, for being here and helping guide that conversation. And we we'll look forward to seeing you next week. I look forward to y'all's updated tips coming this year. And Ms. Beth, how do we really say it here at Notary Stars? Just remember to be kind, everybody. We're all in the same storm. We all have questions, right? We're not all in the same boat, though. Some of us have yachts. Some of us have canoes. Others are just simply dog paddling. So remember to be kind, reach back, grab the hand of another notary, and take them along with you on your journey. Have a good evening, everybody. Thanks for Have hanging out evening. with us tonight. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Thank Glenn. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. And Thank then real both. quick, before we log off, I, I know there was a question about how do I uh, submit 1099s if I need to send somebody 1099s. So the 1099 forms are available, obviously, on the IRS website. They're also available at your Staples or your... Um, Oh, goodness. Office Max. Yeah, the, right. You can go to those places if you need to issue someone a 1099 yourself. OK, I know that was one of the questions. I forgot to mention that. All right, guys, have a good night. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. Thank <laughs> you. Have a wonderful night and come back more often. OK, sounds good. We'll see. Bye. Sue. Bye. <laughs> Bye, guys.